Okay, I'm gonna start recording. Now that everyone has seen us <laughs> troubleshoot, um, we keep it real. Um, I'll it, introduce Lama Somo. Um, you may know her as the person who's been having technical difficulties, but she's so much more than that. Um, <laughs> Lama Somo is an American author and a Lama and a co-founder of the Namchak Foundation and Namchak Retreat Branch. Um, she has an MA in counseling psychology with an emphasis in Jungian studies. And she's the author of Why is the Dalai Lama Always Smiling? An Introduction and Guide to Tibetan Buddhist Practice. Um, and we're thrilled to have her here tonight at the Dharma Collective to talk us through uh, our watershed moment, inner and outer work for engagement, and how we can meet this incredibly complex moment. So, um, Soma, thank you so much for being here with us. We're so thrilled to have you. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here. So let's begin um, with a moment of silence, which uh, after all this interesting tech stuff, I may need more than you guys. But I always like to begin with a moment of silence, um, and especially when we're on Zoom, because the illusion of separateness is a lot stronger in this circumstance, but it's still an illusion, isn't it? So we actually are from one source, and um, we're the, all these waves swimming on one great ocean that is our source, and that's what we're made of. So let's take a moment of silence and all of us feel into that. Start with a nice, big, relaxed breath. and feeling into that vast ocean of awareness, the one that gives birth to the multitude. And we're each this unique wave and all ocean at the same time. And we're feeling our way together with each other in this moment. Hoping that our efforts tonight will benefit all of our fellow waves on this ocean. Welcome everybody. Again, I'm so happy to be here. Um, and I want to wish everybody a happy Juneteenth on this very day, how auspicious. And I'm noticing that this year is a bit different from other years um, because it is a watershed moment, particularly when it has to do with our country and the history of racism and um, uh, people of all color, colors rising up and uh, joining their voices, as well as doing inward soul searching. It's a time for radical change, literally meaning from the root, radical root. Um, we can't go back to the way it's been. And so we want to change outwardly and inwardly and looking at how we can best do that. Um, and so that's the subject of um, the talk tonight is inner and outer change and uh, what we're doing in our sangha regarding that. And I want to hear from you guys what you're doing in your sangha because um, I know that you guys uh, have been doing a lot of work with um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion and so on and about community and inner and outer work. So... Um, I want to just start off with a disclaimer and say, I'm not coming with a bunch of answers, okay? Um, I'm in process and uh, might be for a long time. 
so I'm glad to be uh, comparing notes with you guys. Um, you might be interested in some of the uh, process, process that we're in at Nonchalk regarding inner and outer work and community and the skills to build healthy, um, satisfying community. So um, originally I was gonna come out there in April and be in uh, conversation with you guys, which I was really looking forward to. And of course that didn't get to happen. So um, here we are on Zoom on my very small laptop screen <laughs> and um, we'll just do our best. Uh, so I'm gonna say a few things about you know, my process and thinking about all this and kind of what we've been exploring in our Sangha and um, then um, hoping that we can have some conversation through the chat. I'll, I'll look at some of what's going on in the chat, some questions, some statements, and I'll respond. And um, at the end, I will teach and lead everybody through a compassion practice, which uh, I think is particularly uh, appropriate at this time. Um, because when we practice compassion for ourselves and everyone, um, that is a wonderful way of feeling how we're not separate. So I described that in the beginning of this time. And um, to do this practice, uh, you'll find that you just feel into the truth of that uh, in your heart. So um, I, I want to start way back when I was, gosh, I think I was like 14. And it was um, the 1968 uh, protests in Chicago, uh, protesting the war in Vietnam, among other things. And um, what, what I found interesting, I actually visited the protest at one point. My dad insisted on accompanying me and my friend because um, he felt protective. And we were, we had this bizarre experience. We had to park really far away, of course, because Grant Park was absolutely stuffed with people. Um, and so as we were walking the last, I'm gonna say two blocks, there was uh, a line of young National Guard guys and another complete line, I'm talking shoulder to shoulder for two blocks, of hippies. And so these guys were wearing short hair and uniforms, and these guys were wearing uh, long hair and their hippie uniforms, you know, the bell-bottom jeans and, you know, that sort of thing, tie-dye. And um, so there they are, shoulder to shoulder, and they're all glaring at each other. And to get into the park, you had to walk down this like hallway of bodies um, glaring at each other. Um, and, you know, I was hearing stories from friends who were out in more of the action and everything. And it was so, um, you know, kind of puzzling for me because um, the pacifists seemed just as like, um, how can I say this? militant as the military guys. Everybody was, uh, you know, young and not very processed. And so um, I began calling some of the hippies militant pacifists because um, they just, they weren't being so inspiring of peace. And, you know, they were young and, you know, just not processed and they were just looking outward and not uh, looking inward. And um, I think my tendency as an introvert has always been to look inward. And I thought, you know, I get mad at the drop of the hat. I think I need to practice some peace in here and see if I can get along with people around me a little bit here, <laughs> because actually I'm no better than the people that I'm watching on both sides. Um, and so, I mean, that and other things uh, brought me on this huge journey having to do with inner work. But all the while, I've also felt really strongly that, you know, I didn't want to just be on the cushion and just read. I also felt I needed to um, make a difference in the world. I, I saw a lot of things that needed to change. And so 
I felt I needed to contribute to that as well. Um, and slowly, because probably because I'm an introvert, um, I learned about the value of community in relation to those things. Um, hmm. So uh, where to begin with this? I think then where I want to uh, touch on is inner and outer bodhicitta. Um, so uh, bodhicitta means heart mind of awakening. So um, that uh, mind that feels how we're not separate, that feels the reality of that ocean and how we're all waves. And this wave isn't any more important than some other wave. And um, appreciating the uniqueness of each wave while at the same time appreciating the pure oceanness that each and every wave is made of and, and that that's something we have in common. And when I began my practice as a psychotherapist and then all through the practice, that was my secret sauce actually was um, because I'd done, been doing and was continuing to do the inner work of um, um, finding my own true nature and sitting in that and sitting in the reality of this ocean and waves that I'm talking about, the heart mind of uh, awakening, bodhicitta. Um, I was more able to see uh, sort of the a bit of the pure nature of the person sitting in front of me in therapy and my very seeing it would invite them out if that makes sense to you and um so they they would step out it was just beautiful it was like their old skin like a, a snake was shedding its skin would just come off and the um the next iteration of them that was closer to their true nature uh could step out um, so that's the kind of therapy I liked doing. And that was kind of 80% of the therapeutic whatever. And then there was 20% of it that was the bag of tricks that I'd learned in my degree program and beyond. Um, so with bodhicitta, there are two kinds. And many of you probably know this. There's aspirational bodhicitta, which is the training in it, is sitting on the cushion and um, doing things like the practice that we're gonna do um, at the end of the hour. And then um, engage bodhicitta, where you get up off the cushion and actually do something in the world um, to alleviate suffering and to help people to be happy. Um, and so both are considered extremely important. Um, so later on, I was friends with a lot of activists, or a few of them, and um, they, it's interesting because they were all kind of in the closet about the fact that they did practice inner work. And um, they said, you know, people just in the activist world uh, kind of look down their noses at people doing inner work. It's like, no, you're wasting your time. You should just be out there always doing, you know, the stuff in the outside world. Meanwhile, the meditators were kind of looking down their noses at meditators who wanted to take action in the world. And I do know meditation teachers who were, um, you know, just quietly going ahead and doing it and not really talking about it because people just weren't receptive in the sanghas. Um, that's beginning to change. It's, it's really changed a lot, actually, in the last few years. That's what I've noticed. And so now there's a chance for these two to weave back and forth and support each other. So, for example, with the anger that I talked about before, I know that in Tibetan Buddhism, there are um, specific, really skillful ways to engage all the different parts of our brains and our hearts and so on to um, not just shove the, our um, sort of assertive parts of ourselves into the basement and, where it just festers and we don't develop it so that we can, you know, take it out in public and, you know, be assertive in a skillful way, a skillful and heartful way. 
but it is possible. Um, and this is what I found with these practices. There are wrathful beings. And I'm making a big distinction between wrath and just being pissed. Um, so wrathful action is sometimes called for. And these wrathful beings are pure Buddhas. These are like archetypal beings. And so their principles of reality, they're everywhere, including inside of us, all of them, and out in the world, all of them. Um, and so, you know, imagine a practice where you get to try on for size and inhabit a wrathful being that is fully enlightened and fully compassionate, even while um, forcefully coming forward and enacting compassion. It's really wonderful. Um, and it's a way that we can evolve these parts of ourselves so that they can more purely manifest that when it's time to do that. Uh, rather than having it, you know, shoved in the basement, it stays there, stays there. And then when we're like up against the wall or something, then it just comes popping out and it's like, oh, you know, a mess because we haven't really worked with it. You see the difference. So that's an example of um, inner work and how then when you step out into the world and you really want to affect change, um, how can I say this? If you develop a lot of these different facets through this archetypal work, you're like playing with a full deck, so to speak. <laughs> um, and how wonderful uh, being able to manifest uh, compassion and just you know, pure kindness, uh, the way the Dalai Lama does uh, so often, we can appreciate how uh, strongly and beautifully he does that. And with my teachers, I know I've also experienced them being wrathful. And they can uh, turn on a dime, you know, because they can let go of one thing and move into the next thing. Uh, they've, you know, worked with all of these so much, and they've worked with letting go of one thought after another, after another on the cushion, so that in life, um, if they can just let go of this and step into that because now the situation calls for that. Um, so I, I wanna touch in again to this ocean waves uh, metaphor, which is straight out of Buddhism, um, which I just love because it just works on so many levels. Um, if we can really live from that reality, um, and again, that is bodhicitta, um, then we're going to be more happy and the people around us will be more happy. Uh, so uh, the great physicist David Bohm said, the greater the gap between real reality and our view of reality, the more pain and suffering for ourselves and those around us. Uh, and so, of course, the reverse is true. The closer we get uh, between our view of reality and real reality, um, the more happiness for ourselves and others. So again, um, we can do that by uh, doing the inner work and then stepping off the cushion and really manifesting it in outer life, uh, which causes us to be much stronger in our bodhicitta, in our compassion, in our loving kindness, and so on, um, and develop a real living habit of it. It's no good if it just stays on the cushion, right? Uh, we need to enact it. Um, and if we're really experiencing it on the cushion, we have this burning desire to, when we see suffering, to alleviate it. They've tested great masters and found that they, in their brain, they literally, like the motor function part of their brain engaged when they would see suffering on a video. It, like the, they had sensors on the brain and they could see that the master was like engaging their muscles as if to get up and help. So when our practice on the cushion is that kind of practice, then how can we not get up off the cushion and just want to help with um, every waking hour? Um, so that's how they can 
you know, one way that they can weave back and forth and they each reinforce the other and make the habits stronger and stronger. Uh, and this is what we want. Uh, and it will, of course, make for happiness for ourselves and others. And there's another thing that um, heightens. Um, oh, and I also want to mention that without inner work, what the a lot of the activists were finding was that they were in burnout. And quite often, uh, there could be infighting. And then a lot of forward progress wasn't being made. Um, I've also got to admit that the meditators uh, were kind of, the meditations were kind of coming up dry and um, there was infighting in the sanghas and those weren't accomplishing things as well. Um, so, um, you know, then the question is, well, how can we uh, maximize the two and support the two and have them both be really healthy and effective. We want to make effective change in the world. And so we can't do it alone. We need to be in groups. Well, so we need to be able to do community and do it with skill so that it can be satisfying and um, effective. And it just feels good when it's that way. Um, so um, I have been experiencing community at Namchak, at the Namchak Foundation, and we do kind of an interesting form of community. We do get together for in-person teachings, except during COVID, and um, otherwise uh, we get together in little living room size groups, you know, like four to eight people, uh, which of course has gone online since COVID. And some of them have always been online because some people just don't live near anybody. Um, and we've been experimenting with things like shared leadership. Um, I understand this is really a community-led sangha, so I'm excited to hear from you guys. Um, uh, and we've been uh, really working with shared leadership, looking at what are the different leadership roles and can you know people uh, step up for this piece? You know, let's say facilitating the meeting this week, and then this other person is going to take care of like sending out the emails or texts or whatever beforehand and making sure it's all ready to go and the the Zoom invite if it's going to be on Zoom and so on. When it's in person, somebody might uh, bring the snacks. Uh, there's a keeper of the heart function, uh, you know, where somebody's sitting back and looking at, you know, are some people doing more talking and other people not quite enough? And, you know, are we getting stuck in something and so on and so forth. So uh, lots of opportunities for leadership rather than just one person being, you know, the leader. Um, so we've been, uh, experimenting a lot with this and uh, no final answers, but uh, a lot of great experiences so far. And, and uh, also uh, Aaron Stern, who is the founder of the Academy for the Love of Learning, um, he knows some really wonderful skills that many of us have been learning because uh, he's been doing retreats for us um, so that we can do community more heartfully and skillfully. So I want to uh, share all that. Oh, and we also work on projection uh, because we all tend to project like crazy on each other and we all just want to be seen. And that push me, pull you kind of thing is very human. So being able to become aware of our projections, which generally are unconscious, um, that takes some skill and some work. And so we do some of that and, um, we study and try to enact nonviolent communication so that we can talk about difficult stuff and become all the more um, harmoniously joined together after working through something difficult rather than just being stuck or never talking about it or that kind of thing. So uh, in the learning circles, we're just all in cahoots, you know, kind of in our own little laboratory, learning laboratory, working with this stuff. So I would love to hear in the chat um, or, you know, 
look in the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to share something about your sangha that you really value or ask a question, because I've just thrown a lot out there. <laughs> so I'll just wait. Uh, uh huh. So I, I think we can all see this from Katie. Um, yeah. So, um, so now this is getting to um, another two things. They they have lots of numbers in. Uh, Tibetan Buddhist um, philosophy. Um, and so there are the two truths. One is um, uh, absolute or ultimate truth. And so I, I was sort of pointing at that uh, with the waves in the ocean. And um, then the other is relative truth. So you know, each of us has our own particular point of view and what's true for us. And then we do overlap in things like uh, gravity, you know, which is part of the relative world. Um, what, what goes up must come down, that sort of thing, which, um, of course, um, um, the new in the new physics, quantum physics, you, you know, they're questioning all of those things. But, uh, you know, that time is linear, that... Uh, karma is a, a real thing um and you know that when somebody hits me i hurt right um so that's relative truth and if we go uh into one at the expense of the other either way uh it's going to be a problem so i'm really glad you brought this question um because to be able to hold both truths from a position that is big enough to encompass both of them, um, that is real reality. And um, if we, for example, um, this is, I, I'm thinking of a friend who um, is uh, a, a Zen Buddhist nun, and she was in a deep retreat at one point, and the Roshi um, you know, had interviews. And so she came for an interview and she was, you know, kind of just off the cushion was, you know, seeing the world from that absolute truth point of view. And she said, there's no problem. There's no suffering. There's no karma. There's no anything. It's just all bliss. He said, really? And then he said, what about this? And he pinched her nose really hard. <laughs> and she's like, ow! <laughs> Because he was reminding her, hey, don't forget about relative truth. That's another truth. It, they're both called truth for a reason. Um, uh, ah, so uh, somebody's talking about controlled anger as opposed to wrath. Um, I, I don't know this teacher, so I can't really say what they meant, but... Um, uh, I mean, sometimes I can be pissed and I can have a lot of control and then, you know, do zingers at people where I'm coming just from being pissed off. And I have to say that is not very productive. Um, I don't accomplish much except pissing off the other person. So I'm imagining <laughs> that's not what this teacher meant. <laughs> um, I think, but Trust me, I can do that. I am perfectly capable of doing that. But um, it is also possible to come from a position of wrathful action that is just clear seeing and like, um, you know, just cutting through the bullshit and enacting something. I'm going to give an, uh, an example from my mothering. So uh, one of my kids was in her terrible twos and she, I told her, she was now uh, old enough she could sort of, you know, toddle along the driveway and could uh, get to a dangerous part of the road um, that was a curve, a blind curve, and the neighbor's dog actually had been killed right there. 
Um, and so I said, don't go down the driveway. And the area was too big to fence in. So, you know, I just had to teach her. Well, she was two. So I explained why not to go down the driveway. I explained it in two-year-old language about a car bumping into her and, you know, uh, messing up her body, et cetera, et cetera. It would hurt very much. Well, <laughs> she ran as fast as her little two-year-old legs could carry her toward the end of the driveway, of course. So, of course, as her mother, uh, I loved her and I didn't want her to learn the hard way. That was just too big of a hard earned lesson, right? So I ran after her, swooped her up and gave her, you know, just a little tap on the butt that was more of a gesture, which I'd never done before. And so she was shocked and she was crying uh, because she, you know, was shocked. Um, and I took her inside and I sat her down and I said, don't ever do that again. So that was wrathful action, yeah? I wasn't pissed at her. I, I mean, inside I was actually kind of laughing, but I knew this was life or death and I had to do this. So that's an example of wrath as opposed to being pissed. Uh, yeah, so now somebody's asking about discernment and clear seeing and what's that connection with wrathful action. Um, so this gets into some really interesting Tibetan Buddhist understandings about um, five different forms of that pure awareness um, in that ocean of oneness. Uh, so as it's starting to differentiate into the many, 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 you know, like the, all the billions of waves, it di differentiates into five facets of timeless awareness as it's sometimes um, translated, yeshe in uh, Tibetan. And so these five different uh, facets of yeshe um, have different qualities to them. And they weave themselves together in ever more complex patterns until that's what really manifests all of what we see, manifested reality. And uh, a Buddha can unwind that and, and trace it all the way back down to the pure uh, place of oneness, the root of all uh, manifested reality. So one of those fast, those five facets is like this very clear seeing. It's called mirror-like timeless awareness because there's that sharp clarity. And when you think about it, if you take away the pissed offness and the ego and the drama, and you just look at anger, like peel away the onion and get to the core of um, that anger, it's just this sharp quality. And quite often, it's when I've done that, you know, at first just being pissed and then doing that process that I realize, oh, I'm seeing something that's true. Um, and now that I'm free of all the drama about it, I'm free to respond in a whole different way. It might be wrathful, it might be peaceful, whatever it is, but I'm clearly seeing it. So I'm a little, uh, um, I'm a little bit um, concerned about time. <laughs> Let's see, I want to make sure that I've, uh, mm -hmm. So it looks like, yeah, and yeah, Katie's saying there's 23 minutes, but I want to teach you and lead you through that practice. And uh, Katie, I know that you want to um, say a few words. Um, I just want to finish this piece by saying once again that community is a piece with this inner and outer work that I believe is essential for both. Um, and it's a piece in its own right. Um, so I think we all as human beings want to have an active um, life on all three levels, personal, community, and world. So um, then meditation goes better, outer work goes better, and community is so important for both of those, uh, for 
uh, meditation, not just always meditating alone, but also in community. And uh, work in the world goes better when we aren't doing it just by ourselves, but with a group of like-minded people who are kind of finding a similar thing to do and they can do it together. And then community uh, is something important to, that feeds our heart in, in its own right. So I just wanted to end with that and um, then hand it over to Katie who can um, say a few words and then she'll hand it back to me and I'll teach you this practice and we'll do it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, before we sit, I'll just say a couple words about the Dharma Collective and about our community here. Um, so for those of you who are here for the first time or who are visiting us from a remote location, welcome. And um, just so you all know, we are a community-led Sangha. Um, so we have been operating now for about a little over a year and a half. We're all student-led um, and we're non-hierarchically run. So rather than um, be like a kind of triangle model, we're much more of a set of intersecting circles. And um, we draw teachers across all different lineages, across all different traditions, across all different types of practices. And some things that, you know, we have dance events and other community events. Um, and the commonality that runs through them is uh, the Dharma and the um, pursuit of awakening in connection with others in Sangha. Um, so that's what we're doing here, and we're now doing that entirely online. So if you're here for the first time, you know, stop by anytime um, you can. We have silent morning sits every day, and we have a different teacher every single night of the week, um, often from a different tradition. Um, and I think that's all I want to tell you right now. Oh, one one other thing I want to tell you is I I just loved your um, idea of the of the keeper of the heart person who monitors the kind of emotional state of the meetings. And one thing I wanted to tell you is that what we do on our side is we have a, um, a meta target every week. So each week uh, I wrote in, in, a, in Bash a random meta generator. And each week a random name comes up and then we do meta for that person. So we have this rotating random meta target um, kind of like moving around in the Sangha. So that's one practice uh, that we do here that is fun. Um, and so I'm going to drop some links in the chat about Donna. Donna, of course, creates and sustains our community. Um, and if you're so moved and you feel that you're in a place of being able to give freely, please do. And if you are not in a place where you can give freely, please don't, um, but keep coming back. The um, most precious thing that you bring to the Sangha is your presence. Um, and you're already doing that. So please continue to do so. Come back anytime. And um, now I'll hand it back over to Lama Zuma for some practice. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. That was an inspiring bunch of information. <laughs> All right. Well, so this is a compassion practice. Um, and it's perhaps the most widely practiced thing in Tibet um, of all the practices. And there are a ton of them that are practiced in Tibet. Um, it's actually um, pretty complex how many practices there are. This one um, is built on our um, natural, or how shall I say, habitual uh, tendency as human beings to have internal conversations. It is a compassion practice. And um, it's called Dong Lin, which means um, sending and receiving, Dong Lin. Dong uh, sending and Lin receiving. Um, because when we uh, see somebody suffering, we naturally want to take that suffering away from them. I mean, if we're feeling compassion for them, we want to take that suffering away and we want to replace it with happiness. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and we'll start... Uh, with ourselves and we'll step it out to those it's like me then my people and so on people we easily feel compassion for uh, and then step it out a little further and further and further until it's everybody um, and we do this because first of all 
if we start with ourselves, which actually for us Westerners can often be difficult, right? Um, then we have a basis for having compassion for others. Otherwise, it's kind of shallow. But uh, the more we can develop a habit of compassion for ourselves, and really the lack of compassion for ourselves is just an overlay. But there's no reason we wouldn't feel compassion for this wave in the ocean. Uh, that would be the natural thing. So there's some kind of cultural overlay that uh, gives us a different habit. So now we're gonna reprogram ourselves to have compassion for ourselves. And then um, we, um, uh, no, so metta bhavana is, I think, not the same thing. Metta is loving kindness, as somebody's asking about uh, metta bhavana. Um, so uh, I don't know what the word for compassion is in Pali. Sorry. Um, so, but anyway, um, we're going to use visualization because that's how we have internal kinds of conversations, isn't it? If you imagine talking to so-and-so and having conversation with them, you can sort of, you know, imagine their face there. And then there's this interaction. So we're going to just take that natural or human tendency and uh, move it into this. And, and that's kind of typically uh, Tibetan Buddhist style practice. There's a lot of, you know, taking our uh, habits that we already have and just kind of moving a little bit this way so that they're actually um, uh, a more elevated experience, if you will. Um, so um, it's it, essentially this. You imagine somebody in front of you, let's say, um, who's suffering from something, and then um, you want to take that away from them. And so you breathe that into your heart, uh, which takes a bit of courage. But your heart is where you feel the compassion. Your heart is where your mind actually uh, resides, uh, according to Tibetan understandings and also many other peoples of the earth. Um, so you breathe that in. Um, and you breathe it in the form of like these dense, heavy clouds, you know, sticky if you want, whatever. But anyway, dense, heavy clouds, you breathe them in. So it's more vivid, right? Um, and then you exhale um, these bright, spacious, glowing clouds of happiness and joy for them. And this is possible because of your compassionate heart you can do this alchemy. And here's a little secret. You're not actually having to load up all this, uh, this suffering in you. It's almost like your compassionate heart is a doorway to that big ocean of awareness that's the source of all of us and that we're all swimming in. Um, so it's, all, it's right here. And um, so we can breathe those dense, heavy clouds in through our heart and then it you know just goes into the ocean no problem and then that ocean is like pure joy it's pure compassion it's pure joy it's pure uh, power because it's creating everything um, and uh, uh, pure loving kindness uh, so it's pure awareness so um, from that pure joy aspect then we can easily direct um, that joy into the person we're feeling compassion for. Uh, and we naturally want to do that. Um, so it actually comes quite naturally. And our minds then uh, can direct this two directional thing that I'm talking about with the uh, taking and sending. Um, so that's the basic practice. It's really quite simple. And we see their face changing as we breathe for them. <clears throat> A little bit tricky in the beginning because we have to do compassion for ourselves. So how do we visualize that? I mean, there are a couple of ways. You could imagine your suffering self in front of you and then do this little drama. Or um, the way I like to do it is I like to uh, take a small version of myself, my suffering self, and tuck it into my heart and then breathe the clouds into my heart and, you know, send the uh, glowing clouds into that suffering one. 
So that's how I'm going to talk us through it right now. Um, I, I like to pick a theme so that we get specific. If it's too vague, nothing much is going to happen. You aren't going to feel much. So for this, for the purposes of this, partly because of the times we're in where, uh, you know, people have been suffering from horrible projections on them. And I was talking about projections earlier. Uh, and so we've all experienced projection, both personal and societal in one way or another. Um, and so I'm hoping that, you know, whereas on, on your own cushion, you can pick really exactly what's up for you at, at any given moment, what you're suffering from. I'm just going to say, hey, you know, time isn't really lin linear. And so uh, you're probably suffering from some kind of projection right now and being misunderstood and not being seen, being unseen in a sense because of that. Um, but certainly in the past, probably some extreme versions. So I ask you to just, uh, for all of us to be on the same page with this theme, while we each have our own versions of that. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> because it's visualization, I recommend <clears throat> uh, closing your eyes so you can see all this in your mind's eye. <clears throat> And imagine some version that you that's real for you about being unseen because of somebody having a heavy projection on you. And most of the time, we sort of hold ourselves together and just keep going and this kind of thing. But right now, we're going to let ourselves feel it. And so we take that small suffering self and tuck it inside our hearts. We want to take away that suffering, that experience of suffering. And we want to replace it with happiness. And so with that suffering one in our hearts, we now breathe in the suffering the experience of suffering. So it's not about the drama, it's about the actual pure experience of suffering. We breathe that into our hearts in the form of those dense, heavy clouds. Kind of like rain clouds, like storm clouds. We breathe those in. And then through the compassionate doorway of our hearts, on the exhale, we send the spacious, bright, joyful clouds, uh, powerful ones from the ocean of awareness that we all come from, and exhale them into the suffering one. See it soaking in and breathe again. Breathing in the dense storm clouds, exhaling and sending the joyful glowing clouds, seeing them soak in and breathing again. Seeing the face of that suffering one changing to a smile, brightening, opening up, and breathe again. Now think of somebody who you easily feel compassion for, who you really care about. And knowing, if you know them well, you know that they've experienced some, their version of being misunderstood as well. And the pain of that. And it pains your heart as you look at them. So you want to take that suffering away from them. So you breathe in the suffering that's in the form of those dense, heavy clouds. Breathe it into your heart. And 
And through the doorway of your heart, it goes into that ocean, uh, that great ocean that gives birth to all of us constantly. And on the exhale, the pure, powerful joy we direct from that great ocean and we direct it into this, this suffering one in the form of those spacious glowing clouds. We see them soaking into this person. And we breathe again for them. Keep your in-breath and out-breath even. This is important. Otherwise, we'll get too dragged down by big in-breaths uh, and ignoring the out-breaths. And uh, the out-breaths without the in-breaths make this a very shallow sort of practice where not much happens. So breathe one more time for this beloved one. You don't want them suffering this thing that we also don't want to suffer from. And so we breathe for them again. And I'm sure you can think of somebody else who's also been um, unseen in a way, misunderstood, projected on. And you don't want them to suffer from this either. And so you breathe for them. Again, breathing in those dense, heavy clouds into our hearts. And then exhaling the big, rolling, powerful, bright clouds that soak into them, replacing the suffering with joy. And again. And we see their face naturally changing to a smile. And now they're glowing. Now we imagine everybody on this the Zoom call in this meeting and everyone in this call has felt this before. And so we breathe for everybody right here. And we can do this because we don't have to hold all of that suffering. We let it pass through our compassionate hearts into the ocean of that's the source of all. And exhaling the bright, joyous clouds, seeing them soaking into each one of us. And again, And now we think of whole groups of people who um, have been projected upon and suffered terribly. So quite naturally today, we think of all black people who have suffered in so many different ways because of the racism, which is just a huge fake projection. And so we want to take away that suffering. And so we breathe in those dense, heavy clouds from all directions. And exhale the powerful glowing clouds from the entire ocean of uh, that's the source of all. We're directing it with our minds and our compassionate hearts. 
see it soaking in. And again, breathing. And on the out breath again, sending out, offering these uh, clouds of happiness and joy, ultimate happiness forever and always. And we expand this out um, to people of various uh, groups who have been projected upon because of their color, their ethnicity, sexual orientation, preference. So we want to take away this suffering from all of these people that I just mentioned and replace it with powerful lasting joy. And so we breathe for all of them. And breathe again. And knowing that time is not linear, in the ever-present now, everyone in all of their incarnations has experienced this pain in some form or another, and sometimes very intensely. And so we breathe for all and everyone. Again, equally breathing in the dense, heavy clouds from all directions, and just as strongly sending out the glowing, spacious clouds of joy in all directions to all of them. And again, Thank you all for listening. Bye, everyone. Thanks thank again. You. Thank you. If people would like to unmute themselves and say thank you, you can. You don't have to. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.